Thank you. So my name is Naeem Hussain. I'm going to be very brief here. I've uh, been doing uh, Agile now for about eight years, right? Uh, worked at a large healthcare organization before moving into banking. And uh, it's been a fun experience that you know, we are really looking forward to sharing with you. A lot of our experiences, uh, lots of ups and downs that hopefully we'll be able to deliver a few nuggets to you that you should be able to walk out today and hopefully implement in your organizations. With that said, I'll turn it over to Brian. Okay. And my name's Brian Barr. I've uh, been doing the software development thing for 25 plus years now. And uh, in a variety of different domains, uh, process controls, uh, communications, healthcare, financial services and uh, very passionate around Agile. And what you see in front of you is a trail, and a trail really uh, tries to convey a, a journey that you go on. And the eight years that uh, Naeem and I have been on our journey uh, with two different large-scale transformations from Waterfall to Agile has been a really interesting journey for us. It's stuff that makes us very excited. We're not gonna spend a lot of time taking you down the trail, but we're going to give you a little peeps uh, into what, what that journey was. But for the most part, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about the destination. And the destination is about continuous business value delivery, this concept that we'll be introducing through the, through the presentation. And one of the key aspects of this is about putting leadership and management innovation in the, in the center of your organization in order to achieve this concept of continuous business value delivery. Now, when we uh, were asked to, to come in and talk here, we had asked for a morning slot, and we thought, you know, well, you know what that 2.30 in the afternoon f feeling is like, right? Uh, well, the, the room's cold enough, so I'm hoping none of you will need any of this for the rest of the talk, uh, but we'll go on. Uh, so management innovation, what is it? Uh, Gary Hamill wrote this great book, if you haven't read it, Future of Management, and I'll just read it aloud. Uh, anything that substantially alters the way in which the work of management is carried out or significantly modifies customary organizational forms and by so doing advances organizational goals. Now that's a lot of words, right? But really, when you get right down to it, if you can get to an unconventional management model, those are the things that bring a competitive advantage into your organization rather than potentially unconventional business models. So that's management innovation. Also out in the blogospheres and webcasts, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, information out there about this concept of continuous delivery. And it's a fantastic concept. When you think about the software industry 10, 15 years ago, and all of what this concept of continuous delivery has brought to the table, has been fantastic. It's about getting software out the door in a rapid fashion. But that conversation is mostly about the software delivery aspect of things. And when, when you hear people talking about this in the, the blogs and the webcasts and that sort of thing, that conversation is really mostly focused on release cycles, test automation, continuous integration, the getting the software out the door. And that conversation is really mostly about information technology and the software development uh, world. When we want to talk about this concept of continuous business value delivery, really it's about continually delivering the right products at the right time to your target markets, to your customers, about delivering that value to your customers. And hopefully you'll see as this conversation in this presentation plays out, that conversation is really gonna be about rapidly adapting your business strategy to meet the market demands. And the way that you're doing that is by swiftly flowing from an idea to an, an, a, that idea coming into production and delivering real value to your customer base. So the conversation changes from being about IT to being really about business results. So we mentioned up front, really leadership's at the core of this whole concept and you need it. Naeem's gonna spend the last half of the presentation really focusing the, the energy around this concept of agile lead and management innovations. But the whole concept here is about if you can inject the right management innovations into your company and into your individuals, you'll ensure the organization has sustainable core capabilities. And we'll get more into these four core capabilities. We spent a lot of time dissecting out the organizations that we've seen have continuous business value delivery. These are the four that were really at the core. If you have those four core capabilities, you'll be able to en enable a high performing solution delivery cadence and model. If you're flowing, you'll get to the, 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 the prize, which is continuous business value delivery delivering the right product at the right time to your market. 
And that's the whole model put, to, put together. Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time peeling that onion open. And we're going to start at the outside, at the skin, and get down into the core. So we'll start at the, the concept of continuous business value delivery. And we want to make this really concrete. And we're going to give you a little bit, like I said, a little peep at what does it look like in these organizations that have had uh, continuous business value delivery. In one particular organization we've been part of, in a three-year period, we have saw an eight times throughput increase. Ultimately, that directly impacts the feature function that you're getting out the door to the customers and ultimately affecting the top-line growth, the revenues coming in the door for the, for the company. We've also been able to double our solution delivery team up to 500 associates. And we, we did that by essentially scaling whenever the business demanded it and when we had the, the resources, the money, whatever, to make that happen. And we got this to a point where really the, the ability to scale became purely an, a really an accounting exercise. What, do, what are the resources that we need in based on, on growing by X amount of percent to get the, the, the market demands met? What, how do we go and make that growth happen? We also saw at this organization three, three times improvement in quality. You get to that kind of quality improvement, you're actually working on controlling your operational expenses, directly impacting your profitability. And the key thing here with paying attention to quality is you get the time to be working on the next generation of product rather than worrying about the sins of the past. The other thing that we saw was essentially this idea of uh, having monthly reallocation of resources. When you look at, at a, the way a lot of businesses are organized, they're organized around lines of business. And in this organization I'm talking about, that, was, that is also the case. But there was a regular cadence to looking at, are we achieving the enterprise goals? And if we're not, well, we're going to go back and be able to reallocate resources almost at will at a regular cadence, but faster if needed, and be able to move resources with essentially these cross-skilled teams that can go on and working in one line of business, being picked up, plucked down, and move on to a different line of business because they have all the skills necessary to get the job done. So a little headline from this morning's uh, Agilist. Uh, one of the things, if you want to make sure you're going to kill continuous business value delivery, it's, it's looking at how to kill flow. And flow is absolutely critical to get to conti continuous business value delivery. The first thing that we've seen in organizations where, where flow has been killed very well, and this is actually kind of going back to the waterfall days before we made these transformations to Agile, one of the key things was around deconstructing and reconstructing teams. So think about the scenario where you've got project A up and running, it's getting close to the end of its life, and you're at the most critical time period when you're trying to get that project out the door, you're starting to pluck people off of there to see Project B's team that, that is just getting started. So you're, you're now killing this, this, pro this project that's trying to get out the door, and you're now spending all this time, potentially months, reforming a team, and you talk about killing flow, that just absolutely obliterates it. The other thing that we've seen is having significantly fragmented teams. And this is, uh, uh, some, looks something like uh, you have a, a team that's interfacing with the business, trying to catch the business intent, the business requirements, trying to make that happen within that, that development and solution delivery team, but they can only, only actually do the development for probably about 50 to 60 percent of what that business intent real, it, it, uh, requires. Now they have to reach out for the other 40 to 50 percent to other teams to go make it happen. Uh, that, that is just not a, a flow model. And ultimately, those sorts of things just absolutely kill flow. If you have this in your organization, you might as well forget about getting to continuous business value delivery. Now, we'll get into the, now the next layer of the onion, which is about that was a concept we're calling agile flow. You'll see a lot of elements around here that are pretty familiar, but the idea is about getting from that product innovation, the product idea that's coming into your organization to delivering results as rapidly as possible. We talked about uh, continuous delivery. Again, a great concept and a great uh, advance in the software engineering practice. But most of that is really about getting your product delivery 
to go really, really fast. But how do you know what's entering into that product delivery team if it's the right stuff? We don't, we don't know. And maybe it's, it's way behind what the market is demanding for at that time. When we talk about agile flow, the idea is you move the, the rapid cycle of getting software out the door and product and solution out the door by getting your product innovation to rapidly flow to rebuilding a strategy and realigning your strategy in rapid fashion, being able to get to goals and objectives that essentially for a scalable model can spray out that strategy to a, a larger uh, part of your organization, then you can get into your product delivery that's already moving fast if you've got continuous delivery down. And then ultimately getting to results. The important part there is that you feed those results back into what are the new product innovations and strategies that we're going to be starting on uh, based on the results and how that product is actually delivered to the market. That's Agile Flow. So going back to the results that we talked about in the companies that we were part of, really how does that map to core capabilities? Well, if you're gonna increase your throughput by eight times, you better have a core capability of speed. If you're gonna be able to grow your solution delivery team and double them in a three year period, you better have scalability. If you're gonna improve your quality by three times, well, obviously you need a core capability of quality. And if you're gonna be able to move resources around at will, when, wherever the need is, based on making sure your enterprise goals are king, that's about adaptability. Those are our four core capabilities. And that's the next layer of our onion that we'll get into. We'll spend a little time on each one of these core capabilities. So the first one is speed. And the icon here is time to market. And what, do, what does time to market mean? It's about essentially taking the, the event of an idea showing up anywhere in your organization and getting that event as close as possible to the point at which that idea is out in production, in a solution, delivering value, getting revenue, getting profits coming in the door for your, for your organization. So in the places that we've worked that have had uh, continuous business value delivery and particularly had this core capability of speed, this is what it's felt like. That really any barrier to, to moving those two events as close as possible to each other, those barriers are removed. And what, ha what, ha what has been the model in, those particular, in that company is we've seen major product functions going from four weeks from idea to delivery and minor uh, enhancements moving out into production, delivering value within one week. The other thing is you need to have an organization that's absolutely tuned around impediments being continuously removed. And this has a, a number of aspects to it. it it's sure, it's the, the, the typical uh, scrum meetings if you're running scrum that you're, you're bringing up impediments and all that. But if you're going to scale out and be able to move at speed, this is also about accountability and making sure that, that somewhere in the organization somebody's gonna catch an impediment that comes up and feels like it is their most important thing to do is to get that impediment out of the way of, of that team or those teams that are affected by the, that impediment and getting rid of it in the next 24 hours or people, people are gonna feel bad about that impediment being around. Probably the most critical thing that's going to contribute to speed is around rapid decision making. And the thing that we've seen in the organizations that have this core capability, it's about getting those, those decision makers plugged into the teams and rapidly uh, making those decisions because they are empowered. Now this doesn't throw the whole idea of consensus out the door. That's not the idea. It's actually very important to make sure that within your organization that you're getting buy-in within the organization. But it's, it's also important to say, we've talked about it enough it's time to make a decision and we have to go on. And if you go to kind of the anti-patterns of, of uh, organizations that don't have sp speed as uh, a core capability, well, they're, they're, they don't have these empowered decision makers in the right place. And they, they do the consensus thing for way, way too long. And we mentioned about flow. In, in these organizations that have speed, or ha have speed, essentially they have teams, feature teams, plugged in right next to the business who is creating the intent, and that team is getting 95 plus percent of what that, that business intent is suggesting getting done within their team. So it's getting the right skills, the right people in place, 
and being able to work very tightly with the business and then flowing. Scalability is our next core capability. And this is really about growing at will when the time is right. And when is the time right? Well, it's the time is right when the market is saying, we need more product out of your company. And if you don't, if you don't bring that product to market, well, some other competitor is going to bring it to the market. And the other time that's right is when there's actually a wealth of cash within your organization and somebody says, well, there's a market out there. We can go after it. We have the money. The time's right. Let's go grow. So what has this felt like in the teams that we've uh, been part of? You absolutely have to have foundational processes and tools in place. And some of the key things that lead to scalability uh, and allow that to happen is portfolio management, continuous integration, automated testing, and release management. And we'll talk a little bit more about release management in a minute. The other thing is, I mentioned a little bit about this, is, is essentially having this formulaic rinse and repeat process for scaling and growing capacity. And repeatable growth patterns that we seem to be very successful are things like uh, essentially taking a, a team that already exists, they, they have all the knowledge of your methodologies, and you know, we're, we're big fans of Agile, big fans of Scrum, um, but those teams know your, your methodology, they know your frameworks, and essentially you split that team in half, create, you know, divide the cell, <laughs> and then start your two, your two new teams, and then fill in uh, with new team members so that those existing team members can teach the, the new team members all about the culture, the, the methodology and, and the systems. And this is also about knowing how to grow with, with this accounting exercise when leadership says go. You have to be, if you're going to have scalability, you have to be focused on releases and how to do that in a very scalable way. Uh, we had in this organization 30 plus teams releasing software on the same day. Um, that's, not, that's not easy to, to accomplish unless you're spending an enormous amount of effort figuring out how to make sure those releases are getting out the door successfully. So you have to be focused on release management and, and continually improving how that process runs. And while this is still somewhat related to what we talked about in speed, uh, if you're going to scale, you have to know what are the, the impediment removal paths across an organization so that something showing up in the organization down here can work its way very rapidly to the, the place where that impediment can get removed. It's the only way you're going to be able to scale. The other core capability is quality, and this really has a couple dimensions here as well. Uh, everybody out there in, in the customer bases are expecting quality. It's a, it's a given at this point. If you're, if you're delivering products that don't work, you're probably going to be out of business before too long. But if you've got quality as, as a core capability, you'll continue to ensure and earn the trust of your customers out there. And you'll also be able to get to spend more time on the next generation of products if you've got that core capability. In the places that we've been that have this core capability, what does it feel like? One of the key things is that quality is the top priority. Absolutely the top priority. How does this break out? You think about every communication mechanism that you can get into your organization and it just keeps showing up as quality is the highest priority. And some t for some organizations, this is a hard pill to swallow when they, they think, oh, okay, we're going to start going slower if we, if we make that much focus on, on quality. And the answer is, generally speaking, what we've seen break out when this message gets very, very well sent out to your organization and the culture of quality is, is born from that message getting out there you actually do speed up. We also need to put in mechanisms where we're getting rapid quality feedback, and that has to happen really in that agile flow that we talked about, really at every aspect of that, from product innovation to strategy to goals and objectives to product delivery and results. And you need to be able to, out of all parts of, the, of that flow, being able to get rapid feedback of, are we doing a quality job in every one of these aspects? Probably the most important in, in organizations that have quality as a core capability is everybody owns it. Uh, this is, in many organizations, especially if you go back uh, many years, there was a QA group, you threw code over to the wall to them, and, and they, were, they were the guys that owned it, right? In organizations that have this as a core capability, everybody on the, uh, on the team owns it. And 
Sure, if you go into Agile teams, that, that this does break out uh, fairly well. You have QA and dev and all working together. But it, it goes all the way back through the solution, solution delivery model in the flow of making sure that you're actually baking quality into the, the user stories and requirements that are heading down the line for the, for the team, and that those folks feel the same level of pressure to deliver quality. And in the end, the products really just work. The next uh, core capability is adaptability. And this is about changing rapidly to meet market conditions. So what has this felt like in those teams? Well, we've seen strategy updated in days, not months. And one of the key elements for, for making this break out is making sure that business and IT are actually partnered to build that strategy. And we've seen for, for where uh, this has worked the best, for businesses that see all the value in a, a continuous business value delivery model, they want to partner with you because they believe in all the value that IT is bringing to the table or software development is bringing to the table in that strategy development uh, part of your flow. The other thing is you want to be able to have an organizational memory of strategic decisions that you've made before. One of the, the key ways that uh, I've seen this, this play out very well is if you're, you, you may have to take a number of days to bootstrap your strategy. If you have no strategy whatsoever, it may take a number of days to a couple weeks to get that initial uh, strategy in place. But the majority of the product innovations and, that are coming in and market demands that are coming in are generally incrementally changing your strategy. And if you've got uh, uh, something like uh, what I've used in the past is uh, mind maps that are recording that, that organizational memory of the strategic decisions that you've made, well, you can go back to that mind map and figure out how, how do I need to realign my strategy just by quickly being able to revisit the, the decision-making process that you've had. And you'll find yourself not reinventing the wheel every time you have to realign your strategy. The other part of this is we have to spray out this new strategy out to all the departments that have to go make it happen. And if you're working in a large company, this isn't about taking a strategy to one development team. This is potentially taking a strategy out to tens, tens of teams. And the idea here is that you're able to, we were able to essentially realign our goals and objectives in days. And we do this through that regular resource reallocation cadence and faster if needed. So that's all the four core capabilities. I think it's important also to get some insights into, well, what if these capabilities weren't in your organization? What, what would it feel like? Well, if you're missing speed, well, the competition's always gonna be beating you to the, to the punch and you're gonna have less opportunities to test that real product out with the customers. So the flows that are impacted if you're missing speed is product innovation and product delivery. Now, speed affects pretty much every aspect of your flow, but those are the two elements that are affected the most. If you don't have scalability, well, it doesn't matter how much money somebody's ready to throw at you, if you just don't have any clue and don't have any core capability of scalability, you're just never gonna get the chance to grow. And therefore, your product delivery is in a cycle where it can only do so much. And your results are going to definitely be suffering as part of your flow. If you don't have quality, customer confidence is going to go down. And you're going to be a whole lot of waste. And in lean organizations, we just hate waste. It's going to be spent on product quality issues out there. Again, product delivery and results are going to be affected. And for adaptability, what you'll find if you're missing that core capability is you're going to find yourself doing this seat of the pants, throw the dartboard, uh, throw the darts at the dartboard sort of approach to change. And uh, because we're, you're not an adaptable organization, you're going to be running with outda outdated uh, processes. And key, key areas that's going to be affected there are strategies and goals and objectives. The front of the flow is that if you don't have adaptability, you're just going to be bottlenecked and strangled at that part of the flow. Now, on the positive side of things, these core capabilities actually can feed on each other. Um, if you have quality, it actually can support speed, more available time resources to get product out the door. If you've got quality, you can, uh, you can positively affect scalability in that at the unit level, we've figured out how to deliver quality and you just don't have any opportunity to scale if you don't have quality figured out at the smaller scale. If you've got adaptability, you can support 
uh, speed by adapting to market needs, delivering the right products at the right time. And in the opposite, if I've got speed, I can be helping adaptability, delivering the right products, getting them in front of customers, and then adapting to the market demands because I'm getting feedback from them. So that's, that's the first three layers of the onion. Naeem's going to take it over from here. Thanks, Brian. Quick show of hands. How many of you are in some sort of leadership position in your organization? Good, lots of you. So hopefully, you know, some of the uh, experiences that we have had, uh, you know, you'll be able to take some from them um, as well. So this whole idea of, uh, you know, trying to get to speed, scalability, get quality uh, and adaptability into an organization is really rooted with a lot of you, the leaders of the organization. And whether or not you're truly equipped to be able to scale your agile capabilities within your enterprise, right? And that's what we're going to talk about. Because usually what we have seen is, you know, <clears throat> that in a, in a large organization, uh, the ones we have worked in, usually what will happen is there, is there are a few people who get together and say, you know, we read this thing about agile, it's pretty cool, right? Let's try to do this. And you will have a few followers very rapidly on your team because they think like you, they're just like you. It's about 20% of the people though. There are 80% who need to yet get past that chasm, right? Um, and then when you're talking about doing this at an enterprise scale, and Brian very briefly mentioned, you're talking about releasing software, major releases, you know, every month. You're talking about production environments, you know, we're talking about financial services industry. There's literally no room for failure here or downtime. How do you manage that volume, right? Really, I think, and what we believe is really leading into this whole concept of uh, leadership at the core of this onion. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about. Now, you know, we have four quadrants here. You know, you've got uh, uh, speed over there, scalability, quality, and adaptability, right? And, you know, as we all know, and those of you who actually do agile, right, there are a lot of management innovations that actually agile already brings to the table. Right? So when you think about the manifesto and things like individuals and interactions over processes and tools, responding to change over plan, well, all of these actually are pretty cool management innovations. Right? And each of them actually help with either speed or quality or adaptability. It fits very nicely. Then you go on and take other management innovations such as daily stand-ups. Right? Really enables the communication to break out within the teams across the teams if you have multiple levels of you know, Scrum S2s and S3s and S4s, right? It really allows you to break out that whole uh, communication channel. Then you've got many, many more, right? Sprint planning, right? Retrospectives, pair programming, story doneness. These kind of things will really help with quality. But, you know, it does not really help with scalability, right? And this is where we think our experiences as we have done agile transformations for multiple organizations in these mission critical uh, situations, right? Uh, we've got to talk a little bit about management innovations that are really going to drive us to be able to think and bring uh, something in that quadrant, in the scalability quadrant. So we'll talk with uh, the first one. We've picked like three of them. Uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about smart incentives, right? So what the heck is uh, smart incentive, right? So, first of all, it's measurements. Everyone has some sort of measurements, right? You think about if you are in a traditional uh, shop, you know, you're incented as a QA person on even a scrum team on the number of defects that you find during the development cycle, right? Uh, well, that's, being, that's an interim measure, right? Something that truly may not be of value to your end customer. So, if you have the right measurements, you're going to be able to write, uh, drive the right behaviors in the organization, and that's going to enable the right intended outcomes, and you want to minimize any kind of side effects that might arise from that. And that requires a lot of thoughtfulness. The, the, the goals, the incentives and the goals that you're setting up for those incentives have to basically be um, embraced by the entire organization. So they have to be lightweight, they have to be clear, right? They, do, they have to be stretched targets. Right? That's, that's absolutely necessary because you want to push the boundaries of your team. Uh, but it should be achievable. And here's the key. Everyone who's responsible for software delivery has to own that goal and that incentive. Right? 
So it's not about the measure of how many defects do I find during the sprint you know, that Brian's been coding. Yeah, who cares about that? It's like how many defects are there really in production right, that you and I are going to be accountable for. And if you incent right, you'll get the right behavior. If you incent at the level that you know, we are going to compare and beat each other up, then we are really missing out the, the big uh, uh, prize out there. So let's take a few uh, examples. In one situation, we uh, you know, incented, and this was at the beginning of the uh, rollout for Agile in, in one of the shops. And you know, the whole idea was this shop was actually doing uh, two releases a year to three major releases a year. And what we're trying to get is into four week cycles, right? So that's the background. And we started incenting the teams to actually be able to achieve their sprint goals. So you sign up for stuff, make your commitments, and at the end of four weeks, we want you to deliver. Right? And get the teams to really get into this cadence of delivery. What that will do, and that has done for us, is uh, you know, uh, really grows the confidence of delivery from the business side. So when Brian talks about you know, business really looking at IT and saying, hey, we really think that you bring a lot of value to the strategy, it's because they see this confidence in this cadence of delivery. Right? That's a must. Right? Another example right, is uh, quality. So, you know, uh, there are a few people in the room who I don't want to answer, especially Dennis, for example, right? Uh, just take a guess. If you have 30-some teams delivering software in production on one day, right, how many defects would you expect to be there, realistically? 30-plus teams. Any guesses? In your environment? Guesses? Can't hear you? Four digits. Four digits? Four figures? Four figures? Wow, okay. Others in the room? Come on, all the software guys, right? Girls, you too. Speak up. Other exam other thoughts? I wouldn't be surprised to see companies with 70 or 100 defects that day. Right. So let me give you one example uh, of, of what happened when Brian and I were speaking in Amsterdam a few weeks, uh, uh, you know, last year actually. And I gave this number out, and the audience basically said, that's nonsense. You know, what, what are you hiding? So our average defects for 30 plus teams delivering to production on a single day is about 12. This includes high, mediums, and lows, right? And it goes back really to incenting people in the right manner, right? You're not incenting people to find the number of defects during development cycle. Of course, you care about it, right? That's, that's, a, that's a metric. But you're really incenting saying, when you go into production, 24 hours post delivery, how many defects were found? How many defects were found within the first seven days once you went live, right? Those incentives really, really matter, right? The other thing is, uh, you know, when, when, when the teams are growing, people start caring about it, right? I want to make sure that my best people are funded and seeded in this other team because you don't want to let the quality of this delivery go down, right? You don't want to just uh, have an orphan team uh, take over your incentive, right, uh, and, and manage that for you, right? You want to fund it, and it completely drives a different behavior that you would expect in a, in a development shop. So moving on, there are first and second order effects. And we're going to talk about this in all the incentives, right? So first order effect is each associate is now suddenly going to feel uh, part of a larger purpose, right? They're all going to be engaged in these critical decisions of whether you're going to make fundamental changes to the way you develop software or fundamental changes in architecture because they care about quality, for example, or the delivery. And moreover, if I truly believe in something, I'm actually going to fight for it because I care about it. You know, it's my money on the line. Right? So I'm going to make sure I speak up when decisions are being made. I'm part of that decision-making process. The second order effect is now, when you, when you start getting to this part, organizations start adjusting to the right course. Right? You're starting to self-correct because your entire organization is engaged in a very healthy debate about what to do next. Right? Silos start getting broken down because I really don't care whether you're a developer or a QA person. Right? I care about the ultimate delivery, which is quality, right? or cadenced in terms of getting to the sprint delivery. Right? Teams are really focused on real customer needs, not this metric that you want to generate to give to your boss because no one really cares about it. Right? So you can see some of the uh, issues that kind of start getting resolved as, as a part of this particular incentive. Moving on, you know, the core capability. So if you start incenting people for speed or cadence, you start getting uh, you know, speed. Right? You start incenting for a target goal for quality, you know, defects, for example, post-delivery you're going to start to get to uh, you know, high quality level, right? 
If you start incenting the teams to say, make this work with five people, and then we want to grow it out to 10 other people, and you're incented to take the organization to, let's say, 30 additional teams, and you incent them in that manner, you're going to get a lot of support and a lot of coaching from within your organization. People try to step up and take those leadership positions. right? And now, guess what? If you start incenting at the senior leadership level, then you're in a completely different ballgame. Because now you're able to move resources from one business vertical to another right, very seamlessly, right, because you're ultimately trying to get to continuous business value delivery for your end customer and your target is profits and revenues, right? Completely different ballgame. And we've actually seen this happen. So that's one of them, right? That kind of touches all the four quadrants. Let's talk of uh, one more, scorn-free environments. How many of you work in a, a, a organizations larger, larger than, let's say, 50 people? 100 people? All right, right? So you will definitely have experience, whether, whether not, if not now, then in your past uh, uh, you know, jobs, when you try to go and give an idea to another group, out of your uh, core function, the, the warm response you get from them, right, to implement the ideas. Well, scorn-free environments are kind of meant to remove those silos, right? So let's talk a little bit about what that feels like, right? So one is that, <coughs> There's a culture to uh, support ability to fail and fail fast. In essence, what you're trying to do is to infuse this culture of experimentation. Right? How the heck do you get to innovation if you don't experiment? Right? When's the last time your company came up with this breakthrough product, and how long are you going to ride on that? Right? If you're not going to incent for or, or do things that are going to break down these barriers that are going to really help you with innovation, then you're going to fail in the long run. Right? You're not creating any shareholder value whatsoever. So folks who actually are in these organizations who become non-judgmental, right? So if you go in and try to really do this crazy new idea and you fail, you know, you're not judged based on that failure. You should actually be rewarded saying that you actually tried to do something different, right? That's a very different management mindset, right? Just, so if you, if you have those kind of, this kind of a scornful environment, you know, constructive conflict is going to then happen at, a, at an idea level. Right? You're not fighting about, you know, is, is uh, QA your responsibility or mine? Right? Is development and architecture your responsibility or mine? Right? What you're talking about is what's the idea like? Let's start debating that. Let's see which is the best idea and let those ideas win. Your organization also has this, uh, you know, propensity essentially to uh, say, you know, there are going to be a lot of bad ideas that are going to come through, right? And we're going to wait and look for the ones which are gems. And when we find them, we're going to help them scale it, right? So that's a completely different kind of an environment that you would be in, right? Uh, the other thing is, you know, this will be related back to people's growth as well, right? So if you are in such an environment, you're really, your growth is really because of your track record. How many complex so problems did you actually pick up and try to solve that people shied away from, right? Completely different uh, mindset. So let's talk about how they are actually created. One is that leaders are actually made out of real merit, right? So when someone gets promoted, you're not like, oh, really, that guy? Right? That feeling is not there. Right? Uh, you know, the other thing is you have to actually find leaders with a very high emotional intelligence. Right? So these are people not just very technically savvy, but they know how to grow others. Right? They actually allow others to shine. That's, where, that's a very key component. You allow for experimentation. So as a leader, you can actually do this. Right? You can go back and figure out how much time are you going to allocate for people to just try and fail. And failure is not necessarily a bad thing. Right? If you just start thinking that way and saying, what's the next innovation this brilliant software engineer is going to come out with? But I need to give that person some time to think about it. Right? And the other thing is, you, know, you want to make sure that the, the foundational needs, right, the Maslow's hierarchy, is kind of met. Right? You don't want people to be competing with resources, and now you're suddenly backstabbing people to get one step ahead. Right? Take care of those fundamental things, which as managers and leaders you can do. And I already talked about this, that once you find the idea, you're really going after and trying to implement those gems. So first order effect is, uh, you know, one, one thing we have seen is in, in these kind of organizations, there's never a debate about, hey, should we give two additional people to support, right? If you need two additional people in support so that we can go faster on the development teams, we do it, right? It's, it's not a question of, can I take that one FT from here and fund my little team? And as a whole, we are failing anyways, right? Big outcomes are never impacted, right, by, by these small little failures because you're trying to build that in. Into your, into your uh, sprint planning and such. And as leaders, you're backing your team to be able to do that. You're backing your team to go take the challenges of solving certain technical debt items within your sprints, 
right? You kind of make that time for people to actually do that. Uh, the second order effect is, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of harmony within teams. So ideas can break out, right? Uh, that actually happens. We see that a lot with the community of practices that break out within our organizations, right? People actually challenging each other's ideas, and people actually support each other, not only to be leaders, but actually to follow others' ideas as well, right? Because the next time it could be you who needs that help. Trust is very rampant in these organizations. Uh, so, you know, again, the impact to core capability, if innovations go across departments and everyone's allowed to, is going to benefiting from that, you're going to be able to scale, right? Uh, and, and big changes, because you're in this malleable organization, right, and there's really literally no silos that you have to worry about, you can be really fluid and adaptable, right? So this concept of change doesn't feel uh, alien to you, right? Because top down, you know, everyone's kind of structured around thinking not about their vertical, but really, you know, hey, what are we doing as a business? Where are we heading towards? Silos between, uh, you know, hey, you can't test and get into this environment because you're a developer, right? Oh, you can't write, you know, you can't come in and do regression testing because of a developer. These things go away, right? Because you're focused on, on figuring out how to better the overall system. So third one is uh, inspiring, uh, inspiration factor hiring. Right? And you, know, you think about leadership and you as leaders are going out there and trying to get the best talent on board. So we thought a little bit about you know, what are the kind of people that actually help in our experiences have Agile break out to this you know, you know, 500 people organization all delivering software continuously over, through, the, through the entire year, uh, in, again, in, in a critical setting. But what kind of people do you require in the right spots? Right? How, do you, how do you actually go about, what, what are the secrets behind that? And, and you know, Gary Hamill actually in his book, The Future of Management, actually talks a little bit about this, right? Uh, very interesting stuff. So good companies will actually go off and say, you know, I'll get you, I'll give you an exam, let's see how you do this on, on this quiz, we'll validate that you're intelligent, right? Then you go about and say, you know, can you follow orders, right? Uh, are you diligent? Are you obedient? And as long as you meet those criteria, you're in, right? Great companies will start looking at it and saying, you know, are you really creative, right? Do you take the initiative? Right? Are you passionate about whatever it is that you care about? Right? And if that is the case, then this, these are what we call the entrepreneurial factors. Right? Entrepreneurs by nature are creative, have initiative, and they're really passionate about whatever they're doing. And what you're looking to do as leaders is actually to hire entrepreneurs into your organization. Because those are the guys who can bring change on, right? So how do you, you know, let's talk a little bit more about that then. So, I talked a little bit about this. So inspiration factors determine the entrepreneurial thinking, right? So those are the three, creativity, initiative, passion. And hiring for these capabilities brings in people again who will lead, who will not, you know, not, they're not followers. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what does an interview look like to kind of get these people on board, right? A couple of questions we thought about. Uh, first one is take me through one of the most complex problems you have solved and give me some insights on the problem how you approached it, and how you solved it. And what you're looking for from the response from the candidate in, by this question is, you know, A, did they really pick a complex topic to talk about to you, right? And they're going to be really, and they come up with really creative ideas of how they actually solve that problem for you, right? You're going to get some good insights about is this person really going to be creative, right, in the pro kind of problems you're looking to solve. Second, Give examples of where you have enlisted others to follow your passions and achieve real outcomes. Now think about leaders who, you know, you, you walk into an organization, you want to make a change, right? How are you going to get others to get onto the bandwagon, right? This is about passion. So if you are able to stand up and tell, here's one thing I did and here's how I did it and I needed help from these five departments and I organized all of that, you're looking at an entrepreneur, right? Someone who can actually step up, take that challenge and lead, right? Versus someone who says, well, I only take orders. I'm very obedient. Tell me what to do, I'll just do it. You know, then, then maybe that's the kind of person you require too, but that's not the entrepreneur you're looking for. Right? And a whole bunch of other questions that we will you know, post, post out there as you take a look at this. Uh, moving on, first order effect, you will have a workforce that is going to be continually inspiring. Right? You will have leaders who step out and say, I've got a great idea, I'm enlisting others, we're going to go do this thing. Right? And in the next few community of practice meetings, someone else comes up with another idea, right? and you, you're, you're tagging on, you're adding value, you're building the, you're continuing to improve. Right? They're looking at complex problems and looking and saying, how can I make this really simple and implement? Right? right now we need to find a solution to this. How do we do that? Right? The other thing is, uh, you know, uh, 
there's this uh, notion of spending 10,000 hours on any particular topic and you become a genius or a virtuous, right? Well, these guys are going to get there faster than anyone else, right? And that's the kind of people you actually want on your team, right? Because they're going to make all the difference. The other thing is they will never stop, right? You give them this kind of an environment where, think about it, right? The incentives are lined up. Right? You, you make sure that there are no silos so these folks can go out and work on any kind of problem that they care about, that they're passionate about, and you're basically saying, go. Right? You as a leader are standing aside and coaching and helping them, removing the input impediments and helping this organization really move forward. So again, you know, leadership at the core. Right? As leaders, you can actually make those changes happen in your respective organizations. So the impact to the core capabilities uh, of, of inspirational factor hiring you know, experts, these virtuoses are going to be better at getting the job done faster with higher quality, right? They're so passionate, they're not going to, you know, sit aside and say, oh, that, that defect is all right. They're not going to let that go. They're going to go after it and make sure it gets fixed. Um, and these individuals are so tuned, right, uh, you know, when the business direction has to change, they will change, right? They understand when, it's, when there is a need to pivot for the right reasons. They're grounded in their decision-making capabilities, right? So it's going to be really helpful for your business to have those kind of people on board. <coughs> so we talked about three of them. You know, that's the amount of time we actually have, right? But you can think about many, many more, right? And we're going to be blogging about these. We're going to talk about this, uh, you know, as we go forward. We'll take each of them, dissect them the way we actually did that for the three that we talked about, and uh, you know, go from there. Uh, now we're going to step out of the onion, right? So management innovation, leadership. You, leaders, are at the core of any transformation or any scaling, right? That's a given. You know, you need the right tooling to be able to make sure that you're thinking of the right ideas, right, the right questions that you want to ask to enable these core capabilities of speed, scalability, quality, and adaptability, right? Each management innovation, if you start picking and start dissecting it, you're going to be able to see which of these core capabilities are we hitting. And you need the four to actually be able to go to the next level, which is to enable the whole flow, right? If you have silo-free thinking, you don't have to worry about saying, I have to give the strategy document to someone, and they sign off, and then the next person goes in and does this, right? You know, those barriers can be really reduced, right? Significantly reduced. And that's going to get you the speed, not at the continuous delivery level, which is the IT part, right? But continuous business delivery level, which is what you're trying to really attain, right? So. Uh, that's the entire model again. Uh, you know, we have the uh, leadership at the core, the four capabilities, the flow that's getting, uh, you know, as an outcome of these capabilities, which ultimately drives to the business value delivery. And that's what's going to get you the outstanding business results that we have experienced uh, in some of the companies that we have worked for. So thank you very much for your time, for listening. We're open for some questions. So if I understand the question correctly, let me just rephrase that question, right? So what you're saying is in, in organizations where there are larger complexities? Yep. Or larger companies, larger products, that kind of thing. Right. So you take one thing at a time, right? So, so one of the key things is, so the question is, you know, larger organizations have large complexities. How do you deal with them? If I, if I make, yeah. that, make that really small, right? Um, so I, th I think what you have to start doing is start to lo looking at where exactly your problems are, right? Like, uh, you know, we've given you a framework to think about. Is, you know, for example, I would begin and say, is your issue with speed, you know, is it with quality, is it with scale, or is it with adaptability, right? Uh, and then start digging deeper uh, in each of these things to say where exactly the problem is, right? Um, you know, one example we can think of is, right, if you're, uh, let's say you don't have a lot of automation in place and it takes you two months to do regression testing, right? Uh, you gotta, you gotta deal with that issue specifically and then you need to look at, you know, what capabilities can I bring in from a technical perspective to help with automation? Right, so test automation could be an example, an answer for you know, a speed aspect, which also has a direct relationship to your quality. So in organizations that we have worked, we start looking and saying, you know, what does your entire regression manual suite look like? You start looking at saying, can we break this into multiple tiers, 
right? So tier one being your high risk, right? And then the next year with medium risk and low risk. And you start saying, you know, if I have to go with, let's say, uh, an emergency release or a bug fix release, you know, I need to at least do this much, right? So there are many ways to kind of dissect a complex problem and start looking and saying, how can I look at it individually in small bits and start attacking those, right? Yes, please. Uh, I have a two-part problem. First one is about mapping your human gaps. So some of these, uh, like these core competencies you spoke about, are like how? What would you recommend as best practices for leaders to, um, you know, focus in on to grow these core competencies inside their organization? I mean, is there a set playbook, or is it a uh, you know case by case basis? Yeah, we, actually one version when we started putting this presentation together was to actually talk about the taking a few pages out of that playbook uh, and doing that more of a, giving a sense of the diagnostics that you would do in an organization to say, here's the, here's the core capability issues that you have, how do you dive into it, and then which management innovations you would apply to, to help build that core capability back into it. We're going to be spending more time in the future blogging about it and talking about that that concept in more detail, it's, it's a lot of stuff to, to, to go over in a one minute question, but <laughs> yeah. So in the case of an organization that comes from a you know, more waterfall traditional approach yep. to a more agile approach, yep. okay, and there is already a depth in that there is decades of software already out there, software, yep. which has probably not used all of the new regression and automation capabilities. Yep. Mm -hmm. What would be some of the you know, steps and recommendations you would have um, you know, to a you know, well, so, so, well, so, so uh, two patterns that we saw fairly successful in, in organizations we've been part of is one, you find a, a, a relatively low risk uh, area that, that you have a high chance of success in injecting agile, agile practices and continuous business value delivery practices in. Get your successes in that and, and try to solve a problem for an important person in your organization. <laughs> um, if you can get that important person in the organization on board with what, what the actual results that you're getting out of this Agile transformation, you'll, you'll see how quickly it can spread like wildfire and other executives will want to get on board with what, what you're doing inside that team. Uh, the, the other pattern that we saw was we, you kind of start at a small scale and get noticed, and in one organization we were part of, essentially a 4,000-person organization got the, the dictate from the, the, the president of the division to thou shalt be agile. And, and his problem that he was trying to solve was really about getting more connected to the business value that needed to be delivered and getting it, that idea closer to actually delivering it, uh, into production as soon as possible. So he was, rather than solving a software delivery problem, he was saying, we just don't know how to react to our customers' needs fast enough. So, so one additional thing you, know, you might walk away with is, uh, we started uh, some of the Agile, actually, uh, implementations looking at maintenance channels. Yeah, low, low, low hanging fruit, right? Like, you know, these are not high risk projects. You start getting some of these practices, uh, you know, into your organization by looking at your maintenance teams or your, you know, whatever you call them, right? We call them maintenance teams and get them to go Agile first. Yeah. Other questions? So I, I'll, I'll add to that, at least from a leadership perspective, that one of the best things you can probably do is leave space for your developers to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Because most developers, when they come to the table, they feel bad when they're not given the necessary time to do unit testing. They feel bad when they turn something over and they know it's not done. If you can leave space for them to do refactoring or add unit tests, that to, to them to do the good job, they're going to come out of it supporting you to support something additional that you might want to do in terms of process or, or other improvements. Questions? Yes? When, when you talk about incentives, is it purely monetary incentives or do you have other well, so uh, the, the, the real examples that, that we saw in these organizations we were part of, they were about money. A at some level, if you want to inject, so inject a cultural aspect or a delivery aspect quickly, there's, there's very few incentives that work as well <laughs> as money. And, um, but 
that can be really in, in any form. Or like what, what do people care about? They care about working on cool projects. They care about wherever that incentive. When you get to something that, that can spray and be scalable across an organization and you say, everybody's going to get something extra in their paycheck or nobody's going to get something extra in their paycheck, that's a pretty powerful thing that, that leads to a lot of cross-pollination on we care about this outcome Seriously, yeah, Andre. I've also seen the um, monetary incentives make, make development teams a lot less innovative because they're like, I'm not risking my bonus on that. Like, mm -hmm. They'll be more conservative for yep. the short shot. Yep. Have, have you seen that as well? Yep. You that? Yes, we have seen that. Okay. Right? And there's a way to manage that. Right? So we have actually seen teams which, uh, for example, uh, you know, when we had the first example of incentives where we said you're incented on making sure you actually deliver on time every time, you know, there are certain teams which will say, let's just sign up for 50%, right? And we'll get there all the time. Uh, and, you know, but there are two things that are happening, right? So one is there's a peer pressure factor. You're standing in a room full, uh, you know, of your peers and saying, we're going to do half of what you guys are doing. That feels wonderful, right? Uh, and the second aspect, right, is uh, once as leaders you start noticing that, you can actually go back and tweak that and say, you know what, for the next three months, you guys don't have to worry about this goal. We just take you, you don't have to worry about this goal whatsoever. Go do whatever you can, and then we will adjust, right? And we actually saw that team really spring up and, and, and go to the next level. Right. So there are things that you could, as a leader, say, Here, here's uh, an outlier, you know, how do I ensure that this gets fixed? Yep. But again, it's not a punitive thing. Right? Yeah. It's not a punitive thing. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Is that? <laughs>